trapped for days on the peninsula. The hazards of our primrose path south of the swollen river. Hey everyone, Matt here in lovely Tasmania, and I did an episode of the Forge Cast, which you should definitely check out. Uh, last night with Sam Towns, unfortunately Nils couldn't be with us, and we talked about hammer technique, correct hammer technique for blacksmiths. And this was brought on by uh, an actual fan of the Forge Cast, Forge Cast contacting me uh, about what tools to start with as a beginner blacksmith, and it led into a discussion about that. One of the things that I mentioned to this person was to be careful about what hammer you start with, and there's heaps of videos out there now on hammer technique getting the posture right, getting your grip right and all that. However, there's a few parts of technique that I want to talk about which aren't often covered. And we did go into it on the Forgecast last night, so when that episode goes out at the end of next week, I very much encourage you to listen to it. Now, oftentimes when you've seen my videos, you see me using fairly small hammers. Two of my favorites are these. And this is a five, uh, 450 gram ball peen hammer. This is a 700 gram cross peen hammer. Both fairly cheap, nasty hammers, but I can move steel with these at an incredible rate. And there's a reason for that. It's not because I'm particularly strong. Then you go and see other blacksmiths who start with a minimum of something like this, a four pound hammer. The reason, the only reasons that this happens is because of really two things that I can think of. One is ego wanting to swing the biggest possible hammer and the other one is bad habit and bad habit can often come from when you're starting out you start out with an anvil shaped object and you start out with a sledgehammer that you got from the local hardware store Lowe's or Bunnings or wherever you are in the world and starting that habit that you develop from using those basic tools can lead to quite severe injuries later in life injuries in your knuckles in your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder, and your back. So, I want to do an episode to tell you about a few of the other oblique technique differences and idiosyncrasies of hammer technique that you may not have heard about in other videos. I'm not really going to give you a lesson on technique itself because I don't consider myself enough of an expert in that field to be able to do it. It might surprise some people that this lovely 2.3 pound turning hammer made for me by Dan Moss moves steel faster than this four pound sledge. Why does it do that? It's a combination of two things. One, my technique is good. <laughs> it's good enough. It's not great. The other one is the quality of the hammer itself. And by quality, I don't just mean the overall construction, but the shaping and the facing of the hammers, the heat treat, etc. And that comes down to what I was talking about with starting out with the basic tools. Now, I'm a big proponent of just get smithing. If you're interested in doing it, just start. Get what you can get, by all means. But as soon as you can, you need to move on and get more appropriate equipment. Now, one thing you'll notice about a actual anvil that is cast steel, perhaps cast iron and faced with a hardened steel face, is that it has a thing called rebound. Now, rebound, I'm gonna do this with a light hammer because I'm gonna be hitting my anvil here. Rebound is what allows a, sort of a spring back. And watch what happens when I drop this hammer on here. It bounces like a rubber ball. That rebound is something that you work with once you start getting more proficient at blacksmithing in order to save your arm. Because it's not so much the strike that will cause you injury over time, it's the lift of the hammer. Lifting a hammer back up is what takes most of the energy. Not the strike because you're working with gravity. Now, that's not to say that the strike can't cause injury. It definitely can, and I'll go into that. However, when somebody has first started out their blacksmithing journey, and they've got a bit of railroad track for an anvil, and they go and they think, you know, I'm gonna be a big man, I'm gonna get a big four pound sledgehammer. When you start swinging it, you're going to very, very quickly get tired. You've got a certain number of strikes in you, no matter how strong you are, on something like a four pound hammer, before your arm just runs out of strength. So what happens is you might start out with a good hammer grip because you, you guys are intelligent, you understand physics, right? It's a lever action. If I'm holding the hammer back here, the amount of force that the head is going to impart in the anvil is going to be much higher 
than if I hit it while holding it like this. If you start out swinging a four pound swedge with the correct grip down here, you're gonna tire very, very quickly. And your hand is going to creep and creep and creep and creep until you're doing what is called choking on the hammerhead. When you're doing this, you're going to be imparting much less force. Let's just say I've got a four pound hammerhead and I'm choking while I hit. I'm doing the same amount of force to this 450 ground hammer if I'm holding it right at the end when I slam down. It's a bigger surface area, of course, because the bigger hammer face. However, the amount of force that I can apply with a correct hammer grip way back up here is going to uh, it's going to be magnified. So when you see some blacksmiths who hold their hammers, may not necessarily be choked right up, but really, really close to the head, usually it's a sign of muscle memory formed from bad habits of using too big a hammers too early. Now, sure, you can get physically stronger. Some people are physically stronger and they are very comfortable using something like a three pound or a four pound hammerhead. There are some people who claim to be very comfortable using a six pound hammerhead as their daily one-handed swinger. Now, yes, you can get more work done if you've got the correct technique and you build your body up like that. However, you have a nerve cluster that runs through your, down through your shoulder, through your elbow and into your wrists uh, holding uh, your ability to hold on to things in your, and it connects specifically to these two fingers and your thumb mainly and it's what controls your ability to grip tightly and if you strain that too much by using it too much by having to hold on really tightly to a really heavy hammer for a long time it's going to weaken and weaken and eventually you're going to lose grip strength and you won't be able to blacksmith anymore what you want to do is let's just take this is my favorite main use hammer You'll notice that it's got a narrowing at the top and it swells and you want to grab it right where that swell is really. There are reasons that you would choke up, little planishing work or if you're trying to get detail, because there is an inversely proportionate rule with hammers. You will have more control over the rotation of the hammer with less grip by holding it close to the head, but you will have less force of imparted in the strike. If you hold it back here, you'll have more force imparted in the strike, but less control over the rotation and twist of the, the hammerhead. Uh, also, less accuracy. Anyone who's cut firewood before with an axe knows that it's very hard to, uh, if you're not used to it and practiced at it, to hit the axe in exactly the same place every time. When you're holding a hammer back here and getting the distance that you would have for a, a proper swing, hitting the exact same place, and exactly square every time, or angled if you're doing a bevel, for example, at the same angle, that consistency is difficult without practice. So you really need to be able to do it a lot. And so why would you use a bigger hammer that puts more strain on your arm and wears you out faster if you need to get the practice? Basically, if you love blacksmithing, why not seek to do it for as long as possible rather than burning yourself out, ruining your nerve cluster, and uh, being able to uh, not swing a hammer because of shoulder injuries, elbow injuries, ulnar nerve cluster and injuries that can affect circulation and all sorts of nasty things. Now another mistake that I see people doing often is what I call machine gun hammering where they're trying to hammer as quickly as possible before they lose the heat. When you are first learning and getting used to hammering, focus on nice measured strikes. Measured strikes should be the rhythm No faster than that. Planishing is different. I'm talking about drawing out, getting, uh, moving material over a big distance. Let me show you what um, a moving steel pace would be, about as fast as you would want to do to save injury. I'm going to use my uh, lovely Dan Moss hammer here for this. Now, I've got a bar of 5160 here, which is notoriously difficult to move. Hi. So, I work doing this for my living, and if you want to support my work because you like videos or you like what I make, you can buy from me on Etsy. Or, if you like to just support me without actually owning anything that I've personally made, I do have a heap of merchandise that you can get on Redbubble. I've got t-shirts, I've got mugs, I've got hoodies, I've got all sorts of things that you can actually shop around, customize a little bit, change colors of, and make your own. You can also buy me a coffee through coffee. And there's no signups, there's no accounts, there's nothing like Patreon with recurring payments. It's simply just buying me a coffee, and it's a great way to help me out if you just want to wing me a little bit of motivation. So definitely check out those sites. Make sure you follow me on Facebook and Instagram, as well as subscribe if you haven't already. Anyway, back to the video.
And that gives you a bit of a indication of the sort of pace that I would consider a good working pace. Doing it like that any faster than that is just going to burn you out faster. You have more visibility between hits to see what's happening with the workpiece and be able to change your grip or angle accordingly. So you may have noticed that there's a lot of lateral movement in the swing of my hammer. Um, like I said, my style is definitely not perfect. However, the calluses that I get on my hand are here all the time. That's because I don't do a tight grip on my hammer. I grip here and here just enough to be able to stop the hammer from moving up and down and not enough to stop it from being able to do this. And that allows a whip in the hammer that gives me more force. Some people pinky grip down here and that allows them to go across there and you'll find that you get hot spotting happening in the ring finger and pinky area. There are different methods, I'm not going to go into them. Find your, the method that's comfortable for you. But um, one main thing which Sam Towns reminded me of, which I um, hadn't thought to put in this video, but I will make mention of it as the final point. You'll notice that I actually drop my body into each strike. I'm not just sitting here, just moving my arm like this. I am bouncing, and that comes from my background in martial arts. If you're gonna do a nice punch, you're going to push off from your back leg, snap it through your hips, through your body, and punch through the opponent. Same thing with a hammer. Lift your whole body up. St I step up onto my the ball of my foot, and then bring it down, and keep that arm in a nice straight line as you swing. Don't chicken wing, don't pop it out. You're gonna have awful time of the hammer bouncing all over the place and one miss hit hitting that hard and steel anvil face is gonna ricochet right back into your face. And that's a bad day. So, I will get back to this project and I'll leave you to it. Just some things to think about if you are a beginner getting into blacksmithing. You may not have an anvil that has good rebound or you may have just an ASO that has no rebound at all. So it's going to come from you. It's going to come from good technique from you. And if you start those good habits now, they won't haunt you down the road. So uh, hope this has been informative, and uh, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Out of the storm. See you later. Night birds on high on the rising tide and fearful.